All right, what I'll do is I'll just um, make a start and then we can, um, it's, if more people join us, then um, we can just kind of make that work. So um, I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for everyone to um, join us. Just during the session, if you can, just in terms of just um, turn your cameras off and then when we get to the Q&As at the end, um, we'll just... And we can kind of have cameras on and off and that kind of just means it gives it more space in terms of kind of um just seeing you guys but thank you so much for uh, joining us today uh, terry and justine we're really excited to have you here and um i'm told by terry that you're uh, justine could talk us through um showing risk in the red card which i for me i'm quite excited i'm um, looking forward to this um session we are recording it today just it gives you know people the opportunity to watch it back as well as well as people who've been able to join us uh live and if that's all right if we have um q and a's at the end so if there's anyone who wants to um pop some questions in the chat uh throughout and then we'll have the session for uh, q and a's at the end so terry you have the, said you're going to say a few words and then um i'll just that's put right. myself on mute thank you helen so my name is terry johnson i'm a regional organizer with unison northern and I've been recently transferred to, to working with your branch, so I'm your, your new full-time officer for the Unison members. So uh, I don't know many of you yet, but hopefully I'll get to know a lot of you uh, over the next few months. I'm also the our regional anti-racism lead, and I lead on our Black Members self-organised group as well. So I'm really glad that we've been asked to, to do something today to mark uh, Black History Month. It's also um, Wear Red Day for Show Racing Red Card coming up at the end of the week, and it's anti-slavery day today as well. Uh, the International uh, Day Against Slavery. So I've, we've got uh, Justine King, who's an education coordinator with Show Race and the Red Card. She's going to come in, along and uh, do a session on um, allyship and some other stuff that uh, what against uh, you know fighting against discrimination in the workplace. So I'll hand over to Justine, um, and hopefully we'll have an exciting session. And at the end, there'll be time for questions. Hopefully, if people have any issues, um, just let us know at the end. Thank you, Justine. Grand, thanks, Terry. Um, I'm just going to um, browse my computer, as it's called, in order to be able to uh, load up the presentation. I'll have a little bit of a chat with you while I'm doing that. Um, so, yeah, so as Terry's mentioned, I work for Show Races and the Red Card, uh, and we're based here in the Northeast. Um, but we have offices uh, elsewhere as well. We've got an office in Scotland, one in Wales, uh, one in Manchester and one down in London as well. So we cover the nation. Uh, as is mentioned, where Red Day as well is this Friday. So just as a shameless plug, while my uh, presentation is very, very slowly, by the way, loading up, but I can see that it is. Um, which is basically a day of action kind of to stand up against racism. Uh, and we ask that in solidarity that you wear something red that could be a rather subtle T-shirt like mine with wear red day emblazoned on it in huge kind of letters. But it could just be, you know, a ribbon kind of like or a wristband or red socks or, you know, you could go all out. But it's just about um, trying to raise money. We ask people to donate a pound if that's possible. Uh, and then it means that um, all of that money, by the way, all of the money raised uh, all goes into um, anti-racism education, um, particularly in the area of young people, but adults as well. But we are primarily involved in young people with regards to Wear Red Day, trying to get into primary schools with regards to education. Um, my presentation is playing up. Um, for some reason, there's something in it which, which means it's very, very slow. I can see it, but it's ticking along very, very slowly. Luckily, I can talk for England. So, um, so as we've said, uh, um, show racing the record for those of you who have not had dealings with us, haven't been in meetings with us before, have been going for about uh, 26 years now. We had our 25th anniversary last year. Uh, and as we said, work with primary schools with um, young children, um, years five and six, and also we do high schools, but we do a lot of adult training as well, probably in the region of about 10 to 12,000 adults a year we will do. Uh, and basically, um, we noticed um, that, well, the reason why we, have done, we do so many adults now is because of this, the wonderful world of, well, in your case, Teams or Zoom, we use Zoom a lot, um, yeah, it looks like it's it's just loading up now. Uh, and um, over lockdown, obviously, that was a very, very hard time for a lot of people. Uh, uh, um, and we found that with people on furlough uh, or with people working from home more, um, there was an opportunity for Zoom training. Well, obviously, people had lots and lots of different priorities, but then the death of George Floyd happened mid lockdown. Uh, and a lot of organisations looked at themselves with regards to their race equality awareness and uh, saw that actually 
uh, a lot of their systems could use improving, that there needs to be more knowledge and awareness because people were seeing things on TV but um, weren't quite sure how to have those conversations. Uh, and so uh, people started getting this in for uh, training, which, as I've said, we were able to do because we were online. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just kind of exploded. So I would say at the moment we're probably busier than we have been in the 26 years that we existed before, which is a good thing. Um, obviously, uh, it, it never hurts to educate about prejudice. Uh, that should be a slogan uh, on a T-shirt. Well, I can see my um, presentation, which looks like that means it is all loaded up. Could somebody just give me um, a thumbs up or a uh, to show me? Yeah, yes, thank you very much. It's there. Um, always need to check that because um, one of my tricks is talking away quite happily looking at the slides before somebody eventually says we haven't been able to see them for 20 minutes. So yeah, so at least I know they're on. So that's us and that's you, uh, um, Show Race and the Red Card and obviously Unison. Uh, we have worked heavily uh, with Unison ever since I've worked for Show Race and the Red Card. I've been here uh, eight years now uh, and uh, it's it's been um, a very fruitful kind of like relationship uh, and some of the best training experiences that I've had have been um, with the unison on our ambassadors courses and some of the other courses not trying to kind of like say that there's well it is really I'm, here we go how good are you going to be is what i say everybody else from unison's been fine how good are you going to be um we are online um but we're still going to have a shared space uh, and uh, that means uh, a safe space uh, is also uh, important i'm sure you've all been on training i don't need to go into this too much um as I've said, we are going to talk about allyship today, how to be a good ally. Um, it's particularly important during kind of like Black History Month, but that still doesn't stop the fact that um, we want you to be comfortable talking about issues to do with racism. Equality across the board, but racism as well is particularly what we're concentrating on today. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to have honest and open conversations. And that sometimes can be uh, a little bit controversial or people could be nervous about it, which is why we establish, even though it's online, a safe space. So what I will say, uh, as I say to everybody that I'm involved on training sessions is, you can ask me anything, literally anything, okay? It is impossible to offend me when we're in an educational format. There is no such thing as a stupid question. If it's a genuine question, probably other people are thinking it as well, okay? So I would encourage you uh, to ask questions when you have them. Obviously, we can utilize the chat box, so please make sure that you write any questions that you have in the chat. I can integrate them into the presentation if they aren't already. Or feel free to um, ask as we go along, just put your hands up or as I've said, we'll allow some. I'm going to finish kind of like with regards to content about two. I know that we're, we've got till then, but I'm happy to stick around for any kind of like questions that people might have either about the presentation or about race equality in general. OK, if I don't know them, I'll go and find out. And the final thing that you can do is my name is Justine, J-U-S-T-I-N-E, as you can see over here, Justine at theredcard.org if you have any questions either personally to do with you uh, to do with your work and the work that you do or anything generally around equality again please drop us a line it's not like we just train and then um, disappear okay uh, and so if you do have any questions and you do not want to ask him in front of people because sometimes that is the case people fear that they be judged then please uh, make sure that you either direct message me in the chat box, it'll be anonymous, or alternatively, uh, stick around and have a word or um, drop me a line, okay? Um, I want everybody to make sure that any questions they have around the area of uh, race and ethnicity, uh, um, there's an opportunity for them to be answered, okay? But let's get on with the proper um, um, presentation. As I've said, I do not see anything particularly controversial with regards to it. We are not talking directly about issues to do with language and terminology today. So I, I don't really see that a language amnesty needs to be put in place, but we always do just in case. So by that, what we mean is uh, there may be offensive um, kind of uh, racist terminology kind of like used uh, if there's an illustrative example. And just to say it's not meant to trigger anybody or upset anybody. Uh, it is just about uh, kind of like using those words and then once I've used them once I will then use a nickname or uh, initials okay uh, um, but I will explain what I mean kind of like first time but I do not foresee that happening unless there's a direct question um, but please as I've said I know I've reiterated this I don't know how many times but please feel free to ask me anything okay ask questions that you may have about race equality um, is the way that we move forward you can already see I'm very informal with the way that I do things so it's not about uh, not about kind of having a worry with regards to that okay um 
there will be other activities, probably not breakout activities, because unfortunately I can't charge, uh, um, uh, control the breakout um, activity with regards to this, uh, because we're on Teams and I'm a, I'm a guest. So we'll be doing things in a big room where I'll be asking somebody who may have control in order to put people in breakout activities. But when you're talking, as I've said, ask me anything, but please be aware there's lots of people of lots of different identities and experiences in the room. And so it's being mindful of that. Uh, if we do talk about anything that anybody does find particularly kind of like, um, you know, um, upsetting and triggering, then obviously please feel free to kind of like mute and take take space and take a minute or so. But um, this is more like an information session. I don't see that we're going to be diving in so deep kind of like today, but we always need to be aware about those things. We never really know what other people's situation and experiences are, and we've got many of them. OK, so here's how to be an effective ally, which we'll be talking about, and I'll be getting you to talk and kind of join in as well. It's not just a talking at you for the next 80 minutes kind of thing. Um, why is it important? Um, well, because we are at the moment in Black History Month, which is talking about black history, and it's a time for people um, of uh, um, black and minority ethnic um, backgrounds to uh, to come together, but people for, particularly from kind of like African and Caribbean um, countries to come together and actually to celebrate. OK, so that's one of the things about Black History Month. Yes, it's about information, but also it's about celebrating and it's about celebrating the contributions that black people have made throughout history. But it's also um, about um, celebrating why we are here, how we got here, uh, how we integrate kind of with society and what the history of those uh, uh, um, endeavours were oftentimes missed. Uh, and so this is how it ties in and dovetails uh, into the actual idea of allyship. If we are effective allies and make more inclusive workplaces, it means we'll have those discussions. And as has just been mentioned kind of like before, kind of in the introduction, which I really appreciated, uh, Black History Month is great. I'm really pleased kind of like that it's here and I will really be pleased when it's not here. And what I mean by that is um, Black History doesn't, doesn't just exist during the month of October. There's another 11 months. And what we want to look at is about integrating things into our workplaces, into our home and family lives, into the communities that we live uh, kind of within. So we won't need a Black History Month or we won't need a Pride Month or we won't need a Disability Accessibility Month because these things would have been integrated into our lives so much that they take place all the time. Um, but I do understand why having a Black History Month is important. Uh, and so um, I'm going to make sure that we mention things today with how it dovetails and ties in kind of with the area of allyship. So to be an ally, um, one of the things that we need to look at is how we can um, assist other people and other groups of different identities from ourselves. Allyship itself is not an identity. Uh, it's a process. Uh, and it's a process of building relationships um, based on trust, uh, accountability with marginalized individuals. And so what we'll find is I wouldn't be an ally, for instance, to a black organization because I'm black. However, I do involve myself uh, in allyship with groups where I'm not a member. So, for instance, my nephew is neurodiverse. Uh, he is autistic uh, and I am a, a, an autism. Uh, neurodiversity ally. I go along to kind of like allyship groups. Uh, um, with him uh, in order to help him. So it's not part of my identity, but um, I am helping with that in the group. And that's what allyship kind of like is about. Uh, um, it's about how you help other groups and other individuals but who do not share um, kind of like your identity, because as we'll talk about later, in this case, you are the person with the power. And that is how you can be a useful and an effective ally. Um, because allyship as well is a verb, it's a doing word, which means that you have to do something. There has to be action. OK, it can be small. It does not have to be big. Allyship does not have to be huge, um, but something um, has to be done. You have to do something to help out an individual or help out groups when we think about being an ally. So as we've said there, ally, a verb, a doing word. Um, I'm going to um, ask you some um, question, a question in a second with regards to allyship. So get yourself ready either to take yourself off uh, camera or, or mute if you feel comfortable uh, talking kind of like to me uh, and the group. Uh, if you don't, I would ask you please to utilize the chat group kind of when I ask, uh, ask a question just coming up. One more slide first though. So first of all, it's about talk, talking about the journey of allyship, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you definitely need to understand your privilege. We will be talking about privilege. It's a controversial 
your topic and I shall puncture that kind of like controversy straight away. OK, we need to be curious. We need to be interested uh, in the groups that, that, that we're going to ally with or individuals. It doesn't always have to be a group or an organization. And we start small. So we start off with a single act and what we do is we build that up uh, or sometimes people will ally with a group or an organization about a cause just for a set amount of time and then move away. But it starts small. We start with achievable small things. So it starts with a single act. We absolutely have to be OK with making mistakes. Uh, I actually personally believe that oftentimes we learn more from our mistakes than when we get things right kind of a uh, first time round. And it's not about beating ourselves up about our mistakes. It's about apologizing. It's about learning from them. And it's about trying to make sure that we don't make them again. But we have to be OK with making mistakes. We will make many, um, particularly in the area of allyship, because we don't share those experiences. OK, we don't have that aspect of our identity. So there may be things that we don't know. Don't worry about not knowing. Don't worry about making mistakes. It's all about a learning journey and how we can do that. And as we see on the next one, keep learning. It's a constant learning journey. You can't go, well, I've learned enough about um, LGBTQ groups. I'm fine with that. Um, we can never kind of like learn enough. So I am black myself, uh, um, but um, I can't know all there is to know kind of like about black people because it's extremely kind of like diverse. Uh, and so it's about a constant learning journey. But before we go any further and I talk about some of the ways in which you can be a, a, an effective ally, I would like to know what you think some of the ways you can be an effective ally is. So again, for anybody who's comfortable, if you could uh, just with the kind of like reactions button, kind of like pop your hand up and I'll come to you. Or alternatively, if you would just like to write in the, ch uh, the chat box, because we'll do this uh, in together uh, rather than as a as a breakout session. As I've said, um, I can't break you out at the moment. So uh, what can a person do to be an ally? So I will put the question to you before we go through, through some of the steps uh, and hopefully will you come up with some suggestions. So could you write it in the chat box or could any to be a good ally. Just practical steps, practical steps of what you go. Well, if I was going to be an ally, it would be this. OK, so we've got a question from uh, Kirsty. So Kirsty, uh, um, could you could you let us know what you think? Yeah, um, for me, being an ally is, um, I, I, I suppose, for, from our network perspective, being visible and available, but also being able to actively listen um, so that as an organisation we can we can respond to what we're hearing and look at how we can support our staff moving forward. So for me, it's visibility, being there um, to show support, but also active listening. OK, thank you very much for that, Kirsty. That will definitely come up. Uh, the idea of listening is very, very important uh, actively as well. Active listening. It's not just like, yeah, washing over you. Uh, that will definitely come up um, today in one of the ways that we can we can help be an ally. So thanks very much for that. Helen. So I had um, a few things kind of what Kirsty covered around the list, the learning, the support of the listening, but also in terms of my role, I work in the communications team. So actually making sure that, you know, in my role, kind of how I can support in terms of that representation as well, in terms of things that we do and um, from kind of pictures, from, from staff stories, kind of making sure that that's always in the back of my mind as well. Yeah, thank you very much. That's also it's going to come up in some of the things we talk about. It is key with regards to that as well. So um, yeah, thank you very much kind of like for sharing. Um, um, but yeah, but won't go too much into detail with it because I know that there's definitely a slide on it. Anybody else? Any other suggestions? Uh, don't you be quiet. I don't do quiet. Um, we'll move on though. I know it's just the beginning of the session, but as I've said, please don't don't forget you've got the meeting kind of like chat. So if any ideas kind of occur to you, just make sure you pop them in the box as well. OK, so OK. One of the things that we need to talk about before we talk about allyship is some of the things that aren't allyship. OK, so you may have heard the term performative allyship. Uh, and so um, what we mean by performative allyship uh, is when somebody wants to be seen to be an ally, uh, they want the pat on the back, um, but they're not necessarily willing to do the work. So as it says there, what you'll find is that people are professing kind of like solidarity, but not necessarily in a way that's particularly useful um, for that group. Um, it's not necessarily raising those pro their profile, 
but more the profile of other people. An example, a key example of performative allyship for me, for instance, would be, I don't know if you remember when, after Jack, uh, um, George Floyd um, died, uh, and um, Black Lives Matter um, were obviously on the rise. Uh, not that they, it wasn't the Black Lives uh, Matter came out of uh, the George Floyd incident. They'd been around for years before, starting off with an incident with a young man called Trayvon Martin, who was shot in his neighbourhood by a neighbour, in fact. A lot of people think Black Lives Matter was set up as some kind of anti-police movement, which it wasn't at all. Um, but it had been going for a few years. Uh, and so, um, but obviously it really came to the public forum um, after um, George Floyd. And what we found for, for those that remember is on Instagram, for instance, and Twitter out one day, there was a blackout day. Uh, and what they said for that is that we are going to um, blank out our screens. We're going to put black kind of like screens up. We are not going to post on social media uh, for the day in solidarity um, with um, black people uh, and what is happening around the globe with regards to black people's lives being lost. Uh, so uh, in its way, it was a good idea. Um, it would have been good if they'd had a word with some uh, black activists because um, they felt that really uh, it stopped kind of like some useful progression that day with uh, um, not being able to communicate about certain things. But I mean, myself personally, I understood what was going on behind it and it was about a solidarity gesture. The issue where it comes performative is there were a huge number of particularly large scale organisations, whether that be a large scale kind of supermarket brands or particularly in the area of retail, fashion retail in, in particular, that we found that they were noticing that there was a bit of a zeitgeist on with regards to um, um, Black Lives Matter uh, and issues of black people. And so obviously they involved themselves in this Instagram um, thing or they put up, you know, uh, notices. We find it often, um, you know, uh, it'll either be the black screen or maybe around Pride Month, people put rainbow banners up around their organisations. Um, disability um, uh, Awareness Week, kind of same thing. The thing about these black um, squares is that was two years ago. So um, what I mean by performative is thanks very much. Thanks very much for the solidarity uh, as an organisation. Thanks for very much for saying that you're standing up for black people. Thanks very much for drawing a lot of attention to your organisation for the fact that you were standing up for black people. So how's your organisation changed in the last two years? Uh, how many more black people have been recruited? What different things are you doing in advertising and recruitment in order to get more black people? Um, what management kind of schemes or kind of like shadowing or mentoring schemes have you had in your organisation in order to help black people um, progress uh, within the organisation in areas that they may have found barriers in before? How many people are on their boards uh, or uh, in decision making kind of like processes that have been brought on board from black or minority organisations in order that um, those people be represented? And the answer in the case of these large scale, a lot of these, shall I say, large scale, particularly retail organisations is zero has happened. Nothing has changed. OK, and so that's what we mean by performative. If you are drawing attention to yourself as an individual or your organisation for being an ally, then you have to do the act thing I was talking about. You have to actually be an ally and do something. It's not about a pat on the back for you. It's about trying to make things better for your organization. In this case, obviously, we're talking about race awareness. So we're talking for black and minority um, individuals, but across the board as your organization for LGBTQ um, um, individuals, for people with disabilities or in kind of impairments, for old age, younger age, people from more disadvantaged or marginalized communities, any of the equality strands or areas of justice. Um, don't just profess support in order to draw attention. Make sure that you do something, OK? Um, platitudes, as I've said, kind of like do not help those kind of like uh, groups unless you are you are there doing something. So it's about doing doing it. And here's some example of how and how not to. So as you can see in the performative thing, it's when your, you as an organisation are benefiting the PR and kind of like management get on board or you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that they're doing it and they're doing it. So we kind of, you know, we better. Uh, and so I'm putting something on for those kind of like reasons or alternatively, what we find often uh, will go to people wait a minute, why aren't, why aren't you doing anything about it? And then there's a knee jerk reaction and people can become on board kind of like as allies. Uh, and it looks like it's not actually from a place of genuineness. It was after people were called out about things. Uh, and then on the left, you've got things that are authentic uh, kind of uh, organize, um, organizations and individuals where you realize it's not about you. It's about how we can help other people uh, and make their lives a little bit easier uh, um, and a little bit better. So 
let's talk about some of the ways in which we can do that. OK, so one of the things that we need to be able to do uh, as individuals before we either go out and ally or work with our own organization in order that our organization can ally in, uh, uh, um, with regards to other people is we have to recognize our unconscious bias. Now, unconscious bias is a uh, controversial uh, um, um, topic sometimes, but basically what I'm talking about is the bias that is inherent in all of us, all of us, regardless of what your identity and background is, that we all have these little biases. OK, so unconscious bias are, uh, are based by social stereotypes. It could be a geographical kind of like upbringing, the experiences that you have, your environment all soaks in. We all individually have something called a worldview, the way that we see the world. Uh, and they're all it's individual because obviously we've all had different experiences in life and it's shaped by the social stereotypes, the cultural environment and the personal experiences. So it's the people that you talk to. It's the family members that you have. Uh, we get um, kind of our bias from those. We get bias from newspapers and magazines and music and podcasts and radio shows. Uh, we get it from our experiences when we're out there in the world, kind of like meeting people or doing kind of new things. Uh, or as we've said, we get it from we get it from everything. Basically, everything that's out there, all of our experiences soak in to make our worldview. OK, the problem is our worldview isn't the way that the world is. Uh, we can make mistakes ourselves personally or we can be manipulated as well. And so it all ties into this area of unconscious bias. Our brain makes decisions in six milliseconds. Uh, and our, that's our unconscious brain, that is. And it takes our conscious brain a second to catch up, only a second, OK? Um, but it's very difficult for our brain to change its mind when it's made up its mind. And if our, our brain has made up its mind unconsciously, it doesn't even get to the point where we consciously, critically think about that decision. So it means often we might make split kind of second uh, decisions without even realising that we're doing it. I'm going to give you a little bit of an example now, just with there's something I just want you to have a look at, uh, write and read. If you could just read that for me, OK, those four sentences. OK. So. Uh, this is an illustration. There is a medical term, but I always forget what it's called. This is an illustration of uh, one just one of the wild and wonderful ways that our brain works. Uh, it's a problem solving machine uh, and it problem solves for us. And so what we would find in an average room of 10, we'll break it down to 10 because that makes it easier, although I, I, I see that there's more than you in there. But on an average um, room of 10, there's usually two people will realize that there is something grammatically wrong with those uh, with those sentences by about the second line. OK, so two people, seven people the vast majority of us would not have realized that there was anything grammatically wrong with any of those lines until we got to the final line. And there is one person out of the 10 who still wouldn't know what I was talking about now. OK, still trying to work it out. Uh, don't worry if you're that one. Um, these lines, the first three lines, as we said, the words are mixed up and they're grammatically incorrect, but the majority of us wouldn't have realized until we got to that final line and were given a hint. If that final line wasn't there, we wouldn't have realized at all. We would have kept reading on or getting on with our, our, our lives. Um, our brain subconsciously and unconsciously knows what those lines should look like, so it corrects it for us. So it corrects us, corrects it for us in our brain, without us even realizing, OK? But that isn't what those lines say, OK? It's made sense to us. Our brain has made sense of it by correcting it for us and reading it right, but it's not what it says. So our brain has fooled us. Well, not fooled us. It's just it's worked for us where it didn't really need to. Um, uh, correcting things without us letting know what the true lines were. We do that with people. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we need to think about the area of unconscious bias when we meet new people, um, because we will do our brain will try and do the same. It'll try and say, I know somebody like that. You've met some people like that before. This is what they're like. And you may think that. Uh, and so um, we need to take a second, just take a beat uh, in order to be able to um, take people at face value and take them as inv individuals, rather homogenize them into a group and stereotype them, which obviously 
is not fair and uh, and completely not right. There are lots and lots and lots of types of unconscious bias. I'm just going to talk about four of them. OK, uh, just some quick ones. Yeah, is uh, one of them is affinity bias. You know? So um, that's when we feel a connection to people who are similar to us and it's a natural human response. OK, but it is a bias. Uh, and so to illustrate that, what I'd like you to do, I, I'm not going to do an exercise. You can just do it now in your heads. Um, don't think about your direct family members. OK, so not family members and not your partner, uh, not whoever uh, who may you, uh, your partner be. OK, so other than that, think of the three closest people to you. OK, so the three closest people to you. Uh, chances are those people will have um, some kind of or you feel an affinity to them because they're like you. Like attracts like. So by like you, I mean they could be the same gender as you. They may be the same skin color or religion as you. Uh, or if they're not, they tend to have the same values or beliefs or morals than you. There's a reason why you like them and you like them because you're sharing something. But the sharing of that thing, that affinity means that uh, we do tend to, as humans, feel a connection uh, or feel more of a connection to those people who are similar to us, which obviously puts people who aren't similar to us who may be a different skin colour or religion or nationality or sexuality or ability status or age, it puts them at um, a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to, to meeting us for that first time or for us getting to know them. There's also perception bias that is basically based on social stereotypes as well. Stereotypes and assumptions about different groups. Oh, I've met a gay person, they did this and therefore you meet another gay pe person and you presume they might do that. Or um, Oh, um, I've met an older person. They were absolutely terrible with computers. They didn't know how to do anything. So you presume that an older person employed at your organization will not be good at computers or things on PC. So you'll give them other tasks when in fact they could be an Internet and computer whiz kid. The presumption is just because of their older age that they may not be. Uh, they may not be. But how about finding that out individually rather than making a presumption or a stereotype about them? Or you meet in this case kind of like uh, there's a picture of somebody there with a turban. You've met somebody with who was Sikh before and therefore that you presume all Sikhs kind of like share similar interests. They say share some of the similar interests, but certainly not identical. So it's about trying to avoid stereotypes with perception. We have the halo effect. And on the other side, we have something called the horns effect. Uh, they're opposites of each other. But a halo effect is when you project positive qualities onto somebody without actually knowing them. So if you see somebody, OK, and they're very smartly dressed, they're wearing a suit, they've got a tie on, um, they kind of like wander into the office with authority, for instance, and they're followed by somebody who's a little bit scruffy. They've got kind of like jeans on, kind of like the T-shirts a little bit kind of like ruffled. They look all a little bit disorganized, for instance. The halo effect would you would be you going, well, they look like that person in the suit looks like they know what they're talking about. You may presume that they're more skilled. You may presume they're the boss or the authority in the room. You may think that there is more kind of like chance that you will get kind of like sensible or intelligent kind of like answers from them versus the person behind them. Whereas in fact, it could be that scruffily dressed person behind them who's the actual boss in this situation. OK, and the way, what they're wearing or their kind of appearance has nothing to do with their skills or ability. OK, so the halo effect is when we think good things about somebody without actually knowing them just from seeing them. OK, or thinking that and the horns effect, as I've said, is opposite that you should say you might look at somebody and go, I don't like them. Uh, and that could be on the basis of many things, but it means that you are kind of projecting negative qualities onto somebody without knowing them. And the final one I'm going to talk about here is confirmation bias. We are humans and oh, we love to be right and we will find any reason to be right. So if you use the previous example, that one of kind of the halo effect, if we've decided that we're going to like some somebody uh, in order to confirm that we were right with our own opinions and ideas, we will look for all the positive things about that person to go see. But we're ignoring maybe some of the flaws in that person's character. We're not looking at them as a balanced human being. OK, we want to confirm that we're right. So if we have a stereotype kind of like in mind about certain individuals, then we're going to look for what we can in order to be able to confirm that we are kind of right with that, with that judgment, basically, with what we said about that person. Uh, uh, our, our brain also tends to um, rely on things and um, oh sorry yeah I'll just show you that for a second I don't usually include this one it's just as you would you, you've already seen the reveal but what we tend to say to people with this is um, which is the darker uh, darker kind of uh, box 
Is it the upper one or is it the lower one? Uh, and as you can see, as you'll probably see when you kind of uh, have a look that the, the bottom one is the lighter one of the two, the top one is the darker, except it's not. They're actually both the same colour. So what we need to do about it is remember that sometimes what we see is not reality. So remember in the area of unconscious bias, particularly in the area of media, we talk a lot about this with the media, that sometimes you are trying, people are trying to deliberately manipulate you, okay, which can create a kind of like a situation where you are more likely to demonize or stereotype or be biased against kind of like certain individuals. So what we're asking and one of the ways to unpick, don't go, if you've seen training where it says how to remove unconscious bias, don't waste your money. Uh, you can't re remove unconscious bias. That's the point, it's unconscious, but you can minimize it. And the way you minimize it is remember, I say that it's six millisecond decision from the unconscious brain and it only takes your brain a second to catch up. Give your, uh, your brain time to catch up, OK? Think critically about it. So think critically about the information that we see and hear about certain groups and also um, kind of like allow your brain time to catch up and think about that situation before you meet a new person, before you go into a new experience, before you read a new newspaper story, whatever. Think critically about it. Find out the information to see whether the information that is being fed to you is correct, because a lot of times it isn't correct in order to be able to create that us and them bias, such as all immigrants uh, are coming to this country to steal jobs uh, and take our benefits. Um, which is patently untrue. Um, and so it's about thinking critically about those kind of like information. Also kind of just that statement itself, which I hear all the time is, what is it? Are they uh, immigrants stealing jobs or taking benefits? They can't do both, but you seem to think that they're doing both all the time for everybody. And so it's about thinking critically about that statement and going, actually, no, let's have a conversation about immigration then and opening up that conversation to people so that you can have a kind of like a free flowing conversation where you can kind of like raise some information that would maybe kind of go, well, actually, I'm challenging your point on that and here's the information that I have okay so please remember that we are being manipulated uh, and it's about thinking critically about those things because the important thing about kind of like unconscious bias as I've said is it creates those groundings and those kind of like stereotypes which means that we can treat um, some people unfairly if you dismantle that or do your best to dismantle and minimize it as much as possible as I've said we can't kind of uh, uh, remove it it's also about thinking about well okay if I'm thinking about this thing from as, as near an unbiased kind of like situation as I can and I want to help this group out because I realize that people have been biased and stereotyped towards them and that uh, they are being treated unfairly, how can I do it in the most useful way? And one of the other things that is really important that you do when you're allying with individuals or organizations is you need to check your privilege. Now, privilege itself is an extremely controversial term it really, really gets people's backs up. So for instance, if I'm going to go and do work with young people, uh, young adults, for instance, in some disadvantaged area here in the Northeast, often occurs, uh, and we've been said, right, you need to talk about white privilege because we need to talk about these things with young people. I understand the resistance and the uh, why it gets people's backs up because I may be talking to people who are going, wait a minute, I can't afford my gas or my electricity at the moment because of what's happening in the world. Um, I'm behind on my rent. Food prices are soaring. I can't afford to feed myself, kind of, or my kids. Uh, I haven't got a job. Uh, my life is terrible and really tough at the moment. And you're trying to tell me that I have privilege, that I'm a privileged individual. So I understand why that can get people's backs up. So at Show Race and Red Card, we like to break it down. And rather than use the word privilege, we tend to break it down into what we call advantages and disadvantages. And so you just need to think about the advantages you have in life over other people. And also uh, the disadvantages, that you are advantaged over some people and disadvantaged over other. Uh, and so if we were, for instance, talking about race equality and I was talking about white privilege, what I'd like to point out is that I, I do not get 
white privilege. I do not receive white privilege, shall I say, on the basis of my skin colour. However, that does not mean that my life um, is not privileged. I am an extremely privileged organize, uh, uh, individual, massively privileged, because I do have a job and a car and a house. Uh, and if I want to go downstairs and help myself to some food in my fridge or freezer, it is there. I can turn on my taps and kind of like hot running water kind of will be kind of like coming out or I can turn on my heating and my house will be warmed. I don't have an impairment uh, or a disability, which means I can't use technology and see you and hear you today. And I actually uh, am able to use technology, well, sometimes use technology uh, and, I, uh, you know, uh, and so massively, massively privileged. However, some people in society will not treat me as fairly as others on the basis of my skin colour. So I do not get white privilege. OK, so it's just to be clear when we're talking about the word, well, the, the kind of privilege, privilege, does not say um, kind of like that um, that you are not disadvantaged. OK, um, privilege is not saying that your life isn't hard. It's just saying that in this case, skin color is not something that's making your life even harder. And this is also to point out that I may not receive white privilege, but I certainly know that I have privileges over other people in this room. Uh, there will be certain privileges that I may have that some of you may not have. And I'm going to illustrate that with a little example now about what we need to think about with regards to the advantages and disadvantages that we have over other people. And it's called the privilege inventory. So all I would like you to do over this, please, is I would like you to read those 14 statements. I would like you to award yourself one point, please, for every one that you can answer comfortably. Uh, and then um, again, I would like you to tot up those points and rather than do this as a breakout activity, which we sometimes do, um, I would like you to put your the amount of uh, points you scored, please, in the chat group. Only if you're comfortable, by the way, I don't want people to do things they're not comfortable, but if you're comfortable with it, please have a look at the statements, award yourself one point for everyone that you can answer comfortably and then just write in the chat box what your score was and then I shall have another word about that. OK, so first of all, then um, I'll just read through the statements as well while you're kind of like having a look yourself is one. I have never worried about having enough money to pay for my basic needs. Number two, English is my first language. Number three, one or both of my parents went to university. Number four, I am a citizen of the UK. Number five, I feel safe walking alone at night. Number six, I can openly show affection to my romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence. Number seven, I do not face physical barriers accessing public transport or public buildings. Number eight, people always use the correct pronouns when referring to me. Number nine, I have never been divorced nor impacted by divorce. Number 10, I studied the culture of my ancestors in school. Number 11, I have traveled for pleasure. Uh, number 12, a politician has actively tried and succeeded in protecting my demographics interests. Number 13, I do not have to consider how I speak, dress or look before entering a space without fear that it'll be attributed to my skin color, culture or gender. And finally, number 14, I can live where I choose and move when and where I choose and expect that I will be welcome there. OK, so there you go. You've got them all there. So um, if um, somebody would like to get the ball rolling uh, and if you could put in the meeting chat, um, how many you scored? I'm just going to have a quick look myself and I'll put kind of myself, my, my own score in as well. Here we go. So we can start seeing um, things come in here. Thank you very much to everybody. OK, so uh, if you can continue doing that, there's a few more people in the call. So again, only if, it's, if only if you're comfortable, uh, but if you could put your score in there uh, 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 and what you will find is um, what oh, well, I'll tell you what I originally did when I originally did this um, inventory for the first time and put it in this kind of way. It was because I was doing a conference and there was about 120 people on the call. So I did it as a poll. And so um, the idea was I got people to kind of tot up their scores and then I just put a poll and said, look, if you score between one and three tick here, you know, between four and five here. And then I went all the way up to 13 and 14 and got people to tick there. So I knew when I did it that there wouldn't be anybody really who scored between one and three and probably maybe not anybody who scored kind of 13 or 14. But I was looking at where it might be in the middle and the differences between there. Instantly in the same organization from those 120 people, there were a ton of people who scored between one and three 
and a lot of people who score between 13 and 14 in the same organization. You're about kind of like average kind of like here of, of what we would um, kind of expect with when we often often do these sometime somewhere in the median basically. But it's still there's somebody there who scored six and there's somebody who scored 10. So uh, and I have been in sessions where people have scored as high as 14. So it means that if we're talking about kind of the person who scored um, six there, we're still talking about there's four or five things on that list that that person couldn't score uh, versus other people on the list. Uh, and also, as I've said, the, compared to 14, that's half, OK, less than half. So there's less of half than things. Uh, um, in a balanced and fair, kind of like an even world, we should have the majority of people being uh, able to answer the majority of those questions. Um, but we don't. OK, uh, and the reason we don't is we all have different experiences, as, we, as we've said, and some of us have more advantages than others. Now, um, if I was to put another 14 questions up, another 14 statements rather, it could be completely different ones. We would all score probably slightly different ones, but still we would find the same people because of certain aspects of their identity uh, uh, and their experiences kind of like in life would be scoring lower. And we tend to find that people from marginalized communities, people who may be LGBTQ or may have a disability, or in this case, maybe black or from a minority ethnic group will score lower consistently, regardless of the privileged questions that we put up just because of aspects of their identity. So one of the things that we're saying is when you are going to go and ally with individuals or uh, kind of like groups, kind of like help people out, we need to acknowledge that, OK? We need to acknowledge that some of us have advantages over other people. They're not necessarily always along those equality lines, as we will call them. Sometimes they're just along genuine fairness, as you can see there on the wheel of power or privilege. And what you find is this closer to the centre that you are, the more power that you hold within society and the further on out kind of like on the wheel the more marginalized you are uh, and as I've said it could be around other things other than the uh, equality strands it could be about your education it could be kind of like about your kind of your body size where you live uh, 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 languages that you speak obviously that does tie into equality when it ties into nationality but as you can see um, see where you are and in what you'll find is maybe in some areas you may be nearer towards the circle and in other ones you may be further on out. However, if we are going to uh, do things where we ally with individuals and groups, we need to make sure that we are acknowledging that we have additional power, additional privilege, uh, additional advantage over them. The fact that you are allying them and they are a marginalised group and you don't share that identity shows that that's where your power is. And by the way, it's not a bad thing. People often talk about the privileges that we have in life as a bad thing. They're not bad at all. In fact, they can be extremely advantageous. They can be great things. Uh, what's bad is not acknowledging that you have it, uh, not acknowledging that you do have kind of like power and privilege over other people uh, and um, and not using it to help other people. So as it says there, it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, it's just bad if you deny it or don't use it to advocate for others. And that's the thing about allyship. You are using the advantage that you have in order to help out other people. Uh, and uh, in some ways, some of the ways that you're helping out those other people are ways in which they could not do themselves. Uh, and it's uh, rebalancing and making a fairer society. I will give you an example, and I'm not saying that you have to do this because it's kind of large scale. Uh, but as an individual way back in history, uh, um, as uh, Terry mentioned, um, with regards to slavery, uh, we are celebrating, well, not celebrating, marking, not celebrating. We are marking a day today with regards to the enslavement of people and slavery. Slavery wouldn't have ended just because black people wanted it. OK, black people may have revolted against it. They may have had rebellions and kind of riots. They may have run around run away, for instance. Um, but ultimately, it made no difference. OK, black people did not have the decision making power because they could not vote, obviously, in order to be able to change slavery. OK, it had to be people with the power, in this case, white people coming together and saying this isn't right. We can't treat humans like this. And so it was white people with the power working alongside those black people battling that changed legislation, which meant that slavery was ended. OK, so large scale, I know example, but it's marked kind of like because of today and the fact that we're talking about black history during this month. So people used their privilege in order to benefit um, other people and completely change society in the world in very, very important ways. OK, so don't think privilege is bad. What is bad is not about acknowledging, it's about not acknowledging uh, that power uh, and that privilege that you have. OK. Um, third on the list, then, um, 
one of the important things for us to do uh, if we are to become effective allies is to educate ourselves. OK. Uh, the analogy at the top um, I find useful, to be totally honest, I think it's quite good, which is saying that if you wanted to learn how to boil an egg, you wouldn't call a Michelin starred chef in order to do so. OK, what you would do is you would go and find out from other people or other information sources how to boil that egg. And then when you'd learn how to do that, then you'd had that conversation with that Michelin starred chef. And that's kind of the same with allyship in a way. That's not to say that when you ally with an organisation, they won't educate you or they won't talk or have the conversations with you. Of course they will. But what we're saying is, do the basics first, just because for some of those marginalised groups, things can be exhausting. Um, not only do they have to battle the, the, the issues that they do in society, but sometimes the problem with allyship is it can be quite fleeting. Um, um, the, when something's popular, people may become involved, an ally, um, but time considerations and also some things in their own life, legitimate concerns and lit legitimate kind of like, you know, busy lives means maybe people can't give the time that they may have been able to at some point. So they drift away. And so it can be quite exhausting for allyship groups to have to educate people from that very basic ground level time and time again. And then, you know, they disappear and they have to do it again and, and again. So I'm not saying people from allyship or allied groups won't have conversations and words with you. They want to. They're desperate for conversations and help. But please just do the basics uh, yourself and also educate yourself along the way. That was one of the things that came up from yourselves uh, with as long as kind of like listening, actively listening, as it was kind of like mentioned, which is important. Actively listening is a way to learn. You're actively listening to somebody. OK, um, so as you can see, we want you to do the work and you re research. It's not those people's jobs and communities to educate you. They will along the way and they will help and you'll pick up things but as I've said learn the basics uh, there is a balance okay between educating yourself and kind of act the active listening listening to learn uh, and asking the groups for what they need um, a lot of people with allyship uh, tend to have a very clear idea of what may be needed and have gone in uh, and uh, and that's not really what their group needs uh, I remember when I allied as again I'll use an ex example of my uh, kind of nephew's autistic group I had an idea of some of the things that might kind of help that group out and help him out however when I got there that wasn't really what they wanted uh, and so I had to learn to listen to what they wanted rather than what I thought was best for that group uh, in order that I could represent them in the most um, kind of like, you know, effective way. Please go and read, read lots of books, OK? Um, buy them from those communities. Make sure you buy them from those independent booksellers, though. I'm going to say that later on. I am the world's biggest hypocrite when it comes to this. I would advise people to, um, to to do things kind of like independently. Say, oh, please shop at independent bookshops or independent kind of like art stores or whatever it is that if you're uh, kind of, you know, trying to encourage kind of and help and support independent businesses, particularly if they're from that community. So we're saying, oh, you're going to a wedding. Um, it's, a, it's an Indian wedding, for instance. Uh, you want to wear a sari. Uh, then I'd say, you know, um, you know, don't go to H&M or kind of like ASOS or something like that. Try and, uh, and shop within the Asian community, supporting those businesses and actually and buying something authentic. As I've said, I'm very, very bad at that because I'm the first person to go, oh, that book looks interesting or that podcast sounds interesting or that's whatever. And I just go to the first available source, which is usually Amazon, uh, because I know I'll get it the next day with Amazon Prime, which is great. But you know what? It's more important to support marginalized communities than add to the billions kind of like Jess Bezos has got. So I'm really trying actively to say, right, I'm going to shop independently as much as I can. And that includes just when I go to the corner shop rather than supermarkets as well, you know, trying to support independent businesses, particularly after they've come out of lockdown. It's so difficult for them. Um, so, yes, uh, alternatively, it's difficult for you. You haven't got much money at the moment. You might not have money to buy all of these uh, resources and bits. Utilize your library. Use your library. OK, uh, that's what it's there for. Uh, and it's about kind of encouraging more people to use libraries. OK, uh, they will um, they will order the book if they haven't got it in. So uh, and please ut utilize your library if you're wanting to buy books. I will give at the end of the session. I'll make sure I uh, distribute it to Terry so you can go out kind of like an, and 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 uh, and have a look a book list uh, of, of recommended books that you can read if you just want to want to read more about the subject. But one of the books that I will put, I'm not going to plug one of my own because they're children's books, uh, not my own. Sorry, uh, um, I worked alongside kind of like 
uh, um, some book authors from as born books to do some books. I will put those in the book list to plug them. But I'm going to plug uh, kind of just one book before I go uh, uh, from this slide, which is if you are going to just ring, read one book because you want to know kind of like a little bit more about race equality and educate yourself during kind of Black History Month and the other 11 months of the year, I would recognize the, uh, I would recommend this book as well. OK, I don't know if you can see it clearly. No, you can't. Um, but it's called Why I'm No Longer um, Talking to White People um, About Race. And it's by somebody called Rennie Edo Lodge. I will put her name in the kind of chat box in a second. I would definitely recommend that if there's just one book that you want to go to. Uh, it's easy to read. It's a uh, it's a bestseller, Sunday Times bestseller, and it's a really good book if you're just wanting to get a little bit of uh, education going, but not in a too um, kind of like heavy way, but a very informative way. So we would recommend that book. OK, also, as I've mentioned, I know things might get tiring and exhausting for you when you're allying, but Please remember that some of the groups that you are allying with, they never get a break. OK, and so uh, when things get difficult for you, just imagine how it is for those groups when they have to live that day in, day out. OK, so sometimes it's just giving you a little bit of a taster about the systemic kind of and marginal marginalization kind of like with regards to those injustices. OK. Um, now, it's really important that we speak up. OK, um, we need to have uh, conversations uh, with other kind of like like minded people um, because that's a support for you. Um, allying as an individual can, you know, you may be have curiosities or it may be a bit lonely or you, you may feel very, say, for instance, you're allying with an organized uh, an individual, should we say, in the workplace who's struggling because you, you see that, the, you know, the organization may be acting in a way which is institutionally racist. So you're offering kind of like support for that person. Get support for yourself as well. OK. Uh, get support, um, support. You can have conversations with like minded kind of like allies to see what you can do. You can pull your efforts. You can kind of like help each other. So it's really important to kind of speak to colleagues kind of about that. Get some people that can support you in your allyship journey as well. It's time to have those conversations. It says at the top that if you've got family members who think differently about those uh, um, things, now's the time. Um, you can it, because stuff's on the news all the time is what I'm saying. Uh, if we went back 10, 15 years, uh, issues to do with race equality may not have been mentioned that much. Obviously, it was always an issue within uh, equality organisations uh, and there were always kind of like activists working kind of like around that and allies helping them. But with regards to often news stories coming up, it doesn't happen. They happen more regularly now. People cover them more regularly that things may happen with across the board. So it could be stuff like along the lines of, oh, wait a minute, um, research um, tells us that um, black women are several times more likely to die in childbirth, for instance. Well, let's have a look at that. So that was a news item that was on. Or we see, well, the Met Police is being investigated because of this issue to do with kind of like racism. That was a news item yesterday. Uh, or there may be something to do still kind of like, kind of like, you know, rippling up with regards to Black Lives Matter kind of like protests or people are talking about statues or whatever. It's in the news more. If it's in the news, rather than just watch that news article uh, and let it wash over you, have that conversation conversation with that family member who may take a different stance, who may touch at the television and go, oh God, not again. You can have that conversation, open that conversation up. It's time to have those conversations about those views as well. Um, it's important that we do call out those things, whether they be family or friends, saying things, for instance, or in the workplace. It's really important that we are proactively anti-prejudice. People will not take for granted that you are uh, against prejudice. So, for instance, if somebody makes a prejudicial co comment kind of uh, in front of you or say a joke, because people often there's a thin line between banter and bullying, as we say, uh, and a line that has to be very, very careful, which is why one of the reasons why I don't like banter, because things often veer into that area. And by the way, when it comes to banter, if it's about your sexual identity, if it's about your race identity, if it's about your age, uh, if it is about your gender, um, that's no longer banter when you're joking about that, okay? Um, bantering about uh, and teasing uh, and joking about uh, something that's uh, somebody's identity, that's that spills over into the bullying rather than the bantering, okay? That's not necessarily an amusing joke when it's about that important part of their identity. Um, but what we would say kind of with regards to that is uh, if somebody does make a racist joke in front of you uh, and there are a few nervous giggles and people feel uncomfortable, that but that joke isn't challenged, that person's going to go and tell that joke again and again 
and again and again uh, until somebody does tell them that it's not funny and that joke could be causing some real harm to some people in the room okay so rather than say nothing and then wander out the room and then say to your colleague did you i felt uncomfortable about that joke did you and they go yeah the chances are everybody felt uncomfortable about that joke or comment so you need to call people out then okay it's really important we always say what you permit you promote if you're permitting racist sexist homophobic ableist jokes then you're promoting them because you're not stopping that person from doing that and amending their behavior. And that can be done kind of like in extremely diplomatic ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big confrontation about that joke or comment. Um, but if you're not challenging them and challenging them to that person while other people are in the room who heard that comment uh, as well, um, then um, you're promoting it. We would also say it's important to make sure that um, you uh, raise your voice with those people who do have decision making power. That could be your MP. Uh, it could be uh, um, um, your head of HR or your line manager within your organization. OK, uh, it could be elected officials. Either way, if there is something that you are unhappy about, you need to make sure that you raise your, that awareness with them, whether that be texting them or me emailing them or calling them, particularly in the cases of MPs and councillors and elected officials, let them know that you are not happy. They have been voted into that position to represent people and you are people. Uh, and so if you are not happy, which is what is, ha what is happening to you or to other people, then it's important that their awareness is raised with regards to that. OK, so make sure that you uh, in involve important decision makers. And finally, please vote. Please always vote. Uh, it may be in your local, local uh, residents association. Uh, it may be for a position within your workforce. It may be to become a councillor. OK, or it may be, you know, you have higher political aspirations at some point, um, but whatever it is, OK, you need to make sure that you vote um, just because things are never going to change if you don't. And if you are unhappy with the options, OK, say politically, uh, there's a local, uh, there's a, a MPs kind of people are voting for their local MPs. If you are not happy with any of the options that are, are there, go along anyway, score your paper. Let them know that you're not happy with the options because if lots of scored papers come in, A, they know that people are engaged because sometimes excuses are used saying oh, people just don't care, they're disenfranchised, they really don't care. People do care, but they just don't like the options that they're given. So go for the other option if you are not happy, if you do not think you're going to be represented by anybody else, score your paper, let them know that you're dissatisfied because then they'll go, there's a gap here. These people aren't happy with what we're offering politically. Let's have a look to see if we can fill that gap. And so maybe those people will start introducing some things that you are more interested in. OK, so please do always make sure you vote no matter how big or small. OK, um, I understand, however, that speaking up can sometimes be uh, a difficult task. It's not necessarily easy. There are barriers that kind of like stop us from speaking up. And so again, for a little bit of a mini exercise, again, you can either utilize the chat box or you can bravely take yourself off kind of like mute again. Uh, I'd just like to know um, with regards to you, uh, what you think about these. When did you speak up and when didn't you? You can think of a specific example. I'm not asking you to share that specific example kind of like with me or in the chat box. You can if you're comfortable, though, oftentimes kind of like experience. It'd be useful. It would be useful. OK, but um, think of a time when you um, did speak up, that you were confident enough to speak up against something that you weren't happy about. It doesn't have to be a racist, a sexist, homophobic incident or whatever. Just when you've spoken up against something that you thought was wrong. It could just be a decision that was made at work or it could be even, you know, wait a minute, I'm going to say that I don't want that for dinner. OK, um, when did you speak up and when didn't you think of some instances like that? Uh, and also generally, um, what do you think stops people? in speaking up OK, so what stops people in speaking up when they see something that they are not happy with? Uh, and the opposite, what helps people in speaking up um, when they see something that they're not happy with? So I'm going to put that to you. OK, so again, uh, please feel free to um, to write something in the chat box. Uh, I'm happy to do so in order to get people kind of like going or alternatively, if anybody uh, would like to share with us, could you take yourself uh, off mute? Just let us know. An incident kind of like when you spoke up uh, and when you didn't uh, and what stops people in speaking up. And as I've said, I'm going to type a message too so you don't feel alone. I 
hope you're all busy typing away. Or at least giving me some examples. Or you can, oh, oh, there you go. You see, um, Kirsty, sorry, I didn't see your hand up there. Would you like to tell That's us part okay. of a person? You were typing away there. That's I'm okay. I'm typing away. Um, no, I was just going to talk about what potentially stops people speaking up. Yeah, please and, do. And I think it's often people don't want to be seen as challenging or yeah. don't want to get into a, a confrontation, to use that phrase, I suppose. Um, so I think some people are scared to actually call... Um, call people out um, when they've said something inappropriate um, or, for, or for example if a patient um, isn't very kind to a member of staff for example they don't necessarily then challenge the patient even um, so I think sometimes it's just about they don't want to be seen as being confrontational or um, um, they don't want to, to get into that um, debate. So I think there's some people are scared sometimes. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Thanks very much for kind of like sharing that. Sometimes people are, they're very scared about my, making these comments because, um, you know, um, they're worried about it uh, escalating and escalating into a, a confrontation and a confrontation that nobody needs. Kind of ties into what Helen said with her example, which was that it was with family in law and you don't want to rock the boat. That happens often. Uh, it, uh, it's just it's one of those situations where oftentimes you'll go, uh, oh, God, you know what? I can't have an argument about gay people with Uncle Albert over the Sunday dinner table again. It's going to get nasty. Uh, we're going to start shouting and it's going to ruin everybody's day. So rather than challenge the comment, we just go, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it, you know, so I understand that sometimes, particularly with family members, it can be very, very difficult uh, to, to speak up uh, because we don't want to, as as Helen said, rock the boat or, as you've mentioned, kind of uh, escalate into any kind of kind of uh, com com confrontation rather. I'm just reading um, some some comments there. Yeah, so one of the things there is that um, um, Suzanne's talked about something that has helped kind of like in, in kind of like speaking up and represent people. Uh, and so what she's saying, is she's often spoken up for people uh, on their behalf uh, who may have complex needs, as you can see, and, and support and challenge the stereotypes people have made from them. So it's about confidence as well, that if you've got the confidence to, to speak up, it really helps you. Uh, and in that case, I'm presuming Suzanne, because of her background, felt that she was knowledgeable about the situation uh, uh, and she was in an area of... Uh, expertise she was saying i'm going to call you an expert there suzanne that she was in an, an area of expertise uh, where she she could kind of like help people with regards to that thumbs up indeed hello indeed yeah like kind of uh, an expert there yeah um chantal said um, embarrassment or fear of confrontation or a lack of confidence most definitely um oftentimes it might be uh, again we've talked about the confidence it's about getting the confidence up i gave the example of myself with regards to that it was a few years ago and i've learned from that but yeah it was about confidence i didn't um, comments were made to me uh that were racist in nature and at that particular point i was a student she was a lecturer and i didn't feel confident in challenger in that point i do feel uh happy that i did challenge her at a later stage and re uh, referred back to those um, comments and she apologised uh, that she hadn't necessarily meant them in a racist way, not meaning them in the racist way does not mean they are not racist, um, but uh, she apologised and admitted that it was due to kind of like stereotypes and that she had not had very much contact with black people and that she may have kind of like handled the situation wrong. So the situation was solved, but as I've said at the time, I did not have the confidence to talk about kind of like that, which was a lack of confidence, which is also what Chantel talking about or embarrassment of fear of con confrontation you know you you think it may escalate and somebody might challenge you and it, it could be embarrassing for you you know uh anita's talked about didn't speaking up in a new job yeah that's often to do with confidence as well isn't it anita it's just about the fact that it's new and as a new person it's intimidating anyway do you get what i mean but but until you get used to the systems on, and where people are it may be a kind of like a case of oh you know what i'm not quite sure how this is going to land with these, these people or just again it's a confidence thing so it's a, a kind of like a lack there yeah, one of the important things that Suzanne's also pointed out is that people should be encouraged to speak up when they feel that, that and so they feel that they're not alone and they'll be supported. And I think that's really important. We mentioned it before on one of the slides to do with allyship about making sure that you get cl um, close kind of like, uh, you know, some uh, kind of similar minded kind of like people around you for a support network for you as well. But also that's the case in speaking up. Oftentimes, if there's something that's going on and you don't feel um, confident speaking up as, about an individual, 
have a conversation with other people. Uh, see if they feel the same. If they feel the same, um, pull your staff um, kind of efforts uh, together to go and have a conversation. That could be pulling your efforts in your family, going, you know what, we really need to deal with this situation with our Uncle Albert or whatever. Let's all have a word. It's about how you can also uh, always uh, do that um, in a non-confrontational way so Uncle Albert doesn't become defensive. Or it's, we've noticed this on the staff team and it's continually happening and I'm really not happy about it. I've had another word with three staff members and they feel the same. So as four staff members, you can go to your kind of like superior uh, and line manager and go, look, we're not happy about this and you're not alone. OK, so that's another way that you can speak up effectively. So thanks for that suggestion there, Suzanne, with regards to encouragement. It's very, it's very true. Uh, let's see, uh, typically for a white person. get changed. Yeah, you know what, Ebony, I actually know another white Ebony. OK, uh, and so now I know two Ebony's. Um, yes, and she's found that as well. Uh, and it's really annoying for her and really annoying for me that sometimes that she has to justify her name. Uh, it is a name. It is part of our identity. It's who she, it's who she is. And just saying that, you know, you shouldn't have the word Ebony uh, if you are white. Um, is uh, it, it is just a name. So Ebony does mean black, but does that mean people with the surname black have to change their surname as well? or that black people with the surname kind of like white uh, need to do that. Um, so we always say Ebony and Ivory. If I was to meet a black person who was called Ivory, I do not think that I would necessarily kind of challenge her on that. Uh, and I don't think other people would as well. They wouldn't necessarily feel as co a comfortable challenge on that. But yeah, you know what? You're saying the right thing, Ebony. It's your name. Uh, it's the name that you were given. Um, but I understand how it can sometimes be uh, difficult to kind of challenge people if they're saying, well, why are you called Ebony? But I think you've done it there, uh, as you said. It's your name, you know, and so, yeah, so you, you've and it's a lovely name as well, by the way. So you should feel kind of like uh, confident and being proud about that name and kind of like standing up for it. Um, all of the examples that you gave here all the examples that, that we just discussed do tend to fall within uh, three categories. There are more, but they do tend to fall within these power relationships and knowledge. All of the examples that you have given kind of like here fall into those categories and whether you in each of those categories, it depends on um, how you feel about it or how you hold it in that situation as to whether you're confident in speaking up or not. So we've talked about power already. Uh, I felt powerless in certain situations and didn't challenge, but there's been other situations in the meeting chat where people felt that they were in positions of power uh, at hand have used that power, hopefully positively in order to kind of like influence the discussion. But when speaking up, yeah, so, for instance, if somebody makes a challenging racist mark, remark and you're not happy about it. If that person works alongside you in their office and they're of a similar kind of like role to you or they're subordinate to you, you're certainly more likely to challenge that person than if it was your CEO who wandered into the room and made that comment, OK, because of the power hierarchy. Uh, um, and so we do find we're more uh, we're more in a position of power. Uh, then we tend to speak up less power. We're less likely to relationships. So examples have been given with regards to how sometimes it's difficult to talk to, particularly in the in the case of the example family in law or kind of. Yeah, I've got family members where uh, kind of challenge is difficult, but, uh, particularly because I'm from a mixed race family. So it means that I have got a lot of white kind of um, um, members in my family as well as back members. Uh, and sometimes it means when discussions kind of uh, are had that things can become a little bit fractious with regards to people protecting aspects of their identity but not on the same page. And so, yeah, relationships. People will often say things like, oh, yeah, I would never, uh, um, I, I couldn't challenge that at work. That would be difficult, but it's easier with family. Sometimes it's not. It depends on that family member. So depending on how close you are to somebody, the relationship you have with somebody can make you extremely uh, confident in speaking up because you know the relationship, you know how it will be taken, you know that you can have this conversation, or even if it is a criticism, you feel that they will take it well and take it on board versus the relationships where you know that will not happen and you may be more less less likely sorry to, to speak up uh, and knowledge if you're in an area of knowledge uh, if you've got an area where you uh, um, have more understanding kind of like of a subject like Suzanne spoke about initially uh, then it means that um, you're more confident in speaking up so uh, Suzanne was more confident in speaking up because of a background in health and social care uh, 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 um, somebody who did not have a background in that may feel kind of like less less knowledgeable and not talking uh, about things. So, for instance, uh, with regards to me, if somebody wants to talk to me about anti-racism 
or if they want to talk to me about uh, okay if they want to talk to me about Prince and the Revolution 1983 to 1986 four landmark albums you can talk about anything you want with me challenge me about anything I'm in an area of knowledge with those Prince albums and so feel extremely confident in speaking up and challenging you were you to argue about a guitar solo for instance very very confident however as has just been mentioned, if there was somebody with complex mental health needs uh, and issues, the fact that I sit in kind of once every couple of weeks to my um, um, nephew's neurodiverse meetings uh, still does not give me en enough knowledge <laughs> and awareness about that to be able to speak up. So I'm not in a position of knowledge such as you would be. Uh, and so I'm less likely to speak up and challenge when somebody says something. OK, so they tend to fall within these boxes, but I would always, always, always uh, encourage people to speak up when you see inequity and unfairness if you feel comfortable. Because remember as well, we're, we w want to encourage people to have the confidence to speak up, but we never force people kind of like to speak or, or say that you should kind of, oh, you should have done this then. You don't know what the situation kind of may have been to, to with them. And as has already been pointed out, sometimes people want to avoid a situation escalating and your mental and physical health is paramount in all situations. So it's only about speaking up when you feel comfortable to do so. OK. Um, although we've said to speak up, it's really important that we uh, speak up for marginalised groups, but not over. OK, we need to make sure that we centre the conversation around those groups uh, rather than make it about themselves or yourself rather. Uh, that often happens with groups, people, right meaning people, by the way, this is not a deliberate kind of like thing, right meaning people come in and try and help groups. Um, but sometimes it's about I think this and I think that rather than uh, what the group kind of like needs. OK, um, it's a good idea to check in on your black or gay or disabled friends and families and comments and seeing what you can do to support them, particularly when there's been incidents. So if there's been a terrorist attack, it's a good idea to check in on your mates. Uh, so, for instance, when there's a, there are attacks or kind of like that, you see that uh, there may be kind of like members uh, of certain communities who have been kind of like shot or killed, kind of like or injured. Uh, or you see injustice, kind of like some big scale thing on the TV that everybody will be seeing and go, ooh. And you might want to contact them and see what they can do to support them. I will give you an example with regards to that. Um, it's not exactly the same situation, but when the war in Ukraine started happening, we started seeing kind of like uh, a lot of bombings and a lot of people in very difficult circumstances because of the war. Um, we as an organization and also me as an individual reached out to somebody who works regularly with us, who uh, was uh, a young boy during the Bosnian war. Uh, and because come, you may, if you've been on our training, have seen him. He's a wonderful individual. Uh, um, but I recognised that some of this might be difficult for him, and it was indeed extremely, extremely triggering for him. Uh, uh, and obviously, seeing that stuff, he went through a very, very, and still is going through a very, very tough time because of thinking about what happened to him. So it's about um, calling those individuals that you know just to see if they need support, just checking in, saying hi, how are you doing? You know. Uh, because some of this thing, some of these things in incidents can be very triggering for individuals. And it's also, uh, as I've said about the making mistakes, it's the same thing. You cannot know everything. You are not expected to know any, everything. OK, so don't worry. Um, kind of like um, if mistakes are, are made, you just learn about them along the way. And so another analogy I always, as you have already gathered from the fact that I mentioned Prince of the Revolution. Uh, um, I am a huge music fan. You can't see behind me, but it's absolutely packed full of CDs and kind of uh, 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 and vinyl. And so I like to use the analogy of a band when we think about allyship. So you as an ally, you are not the lead singer of the band. OK, uh, you're not the bass player or the guitar. You're not even the drummer. And no offense if there's any drummers around there. I know you provide the rhythm that drives the songs. Um, you are no member of the band as an ally. You are a member of the crew. OK, so your job is to get the band out on the road, getting them playing their songs, making people happy listening to them. OK, so as an ally, your job is to help the group get their voice heard. It's not about you making it about you and your voice. You're allowing them to do so. And as I've said, sometimes that might not be something that you would necessarily do. So we have to learn as advocates to sometimes take a step back. Yes, make sure that you make those suggestions, 
for helping those people in those groups, but ultimately the decision with how to progress lies with them, even if you think that it might not be the best thing. OK, um, particularly around the area that you might work in. We've already seen that somebody's mentioned about they work with people with complex kind of like mental health needs. Uh, and sometimes when we are working with people with mental health needs um, as advocates, it's really great because we can get those voices heard uh, in a way that maybe they are not able. They may not be listened to. Uh, they may not be comfortable or confident or, you know, they may not have the physical ability to be able to do that. So it's about raising those people's voices, but raising their voices, not what we think is kind of like right. Again, I know I keep mentioning examples, but I just think they're useful for people. So you can see what I'm talking about. When I first joined the autism group for my nephew and I went in, I noticed that the allies, myself included, were talking a lot. Uh, and the autistic young young people, it was for a group 25 and under, um, they weren't talking very much. We were talking over them, coming up with these great plans of what them to do, but they weren't really talking about what they wanted to do. And I thought that was an issue. And so I spoke with another person who was allying and what we decided to do was change the group. And they were, oh, well, change how it, how it worked. From now on, the hour that's allotted for kind of like the group, the first half hour, the autistic young people speak together. They get a chance to chat about what they'd like to do, kind of like within the group and outside the group as well. And then for the second half hour, they're there with a the facilitator. So there's somebody there, but the facilitator remains silent. OK, uh, uh, and so they can just have a little bit of a chat about what they want. And then the second half hour, we come in and have a big chat about how their lives are going, what they'd like to talk about and what they'd like to do, how we can assist them in doing that after they've had time to speak with amongst themselves about what they would like to do. And occasionally the things that they would like to do, I know, I know for a fact that us and the allies could do it uh, much quicker and much more effectively by using the channels and the routes that we know. However, that is not what the group wanted. Uh, they wanted to do it in a different way and we have to respect their beliefs uh, and, and go along that way. OK, it's about empowering them to do it. Uh, not just taking the reins and doing it ourselves to make kind of like things easier. OK, so it's important that we speak up on behalf of those groups. But please do not speak over those groups. OK. Uh, another one, uh, and I've briefly touched on it before. Please make sure that you raise up the voices of those from marginalised groups. And one of the things that you can do is support um, businesses and create opportunities to people from marginalised communities. So as I've said, shopping those independent kind of like um, bookshops, well, not just bookshops, shopping those independent shops from um, marginalised communities whenever possible, or buying things from your business. You know, if you've got business, big business things, I'll, I'll tell you a simple thing that we um, kind of do kind of fairly regularly and it's really kind of effective. There is a group that we know who have, again, got a complex kind of like mental health kind of issues. And one of those things that they do kind of like uh, as part of their kind of uh, uh, rehabilitation and also some of the work kind of like that they do to upskill them is they they run kind of like catering. So, you know, they make kind of like sandwiches and buffets and things for thi uh, and things for people. So uh, when we are having a meeting and we know that we're buying sandwiches in we buy it from them you know it's as simple as that delicious food by the way and very 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 well prepared but at the same time we are supporting kind of like a group that may have not received you know you know support from us before so buy in your kit buy in your catering buy in your sandwiches you know buy in your knowledge if you're getting people get people from the actual community to come and kind of like speak about that help those um people from marginalized communities raise their voice up that way if you're on social media try following some accounts of black lgbtq or disability accounts okay so for instance in the case of black accounts i'm going to recommend anybody uh, to follow at the moment on Instagram, I would recommend Everyday Racism. OK, they are two sisters, Naomi and Natalie, and I think they're doing excellent work. They haven't been gone long, going long. They set themselves up just during the um, during lockdown. Um, I, I'm, we're not affiliated in them any, any way. Or, uh, you know, I'm not giving this kind of like as a recommendation because we're affiliated. Other than the fact I think they're doing good work. We even got them on one of our podcasts to talk about their work. And so everyday racism it's called. So I check it out on Instagram. Lots of memes, lots of information, lots of political information. It's a way to keep current. There are lots and lots of other accounts as well. The black curriculum and, you know, loads of different things that you, you could follow. And again, those recommendations will be in the, the list that we can send you afterwards. But just as a, a, a an aside, there's one of them, everyday racism. If any of you have got any suggestions that you follow accounts across the quality that you think is really good, pop them in the chat box. We'll share them at the end of the session in about five minutes. Um, and also, by the way, when you're following those kind of like accounts as an ally, 
that's not really doing anything by following them. You kind of are, but what you can do, again, allyship doesn't have to be big. If you see something interesting, uh, retweet it or go and have a conversation with people at work going, oh, I saw something interesting today and you just have a chat. Be an ally in that way, raising up the voice in that way, raising up the voices of those marginalised groups, okay? Doing something there. Remember, uh, allyship is an actual doing thing. Um, hold your organisation accountable. You're coming on this training, you're doing this work, you're kind of like helping us out. Hold your organisation accountable. What are they doing? What are they doing around the area of race equality? What are they doing in order to kind of help help people? OK, so it's not just about you doing good work. It's about saying to your organization, have we updated our race equality kind of like policy? Have we got kind of like a, a separate black workers kind of like group that we could go to and access? I know you have via Unison that you've got a black members group. Uh, that's a way to get support kind of like if you are from an ethnic minority group and you're not from an ethnic minority group. It's about understanding that those groups are useful and important. Don't worry, in black members groups, we don't just sit around talking about white people okay uh which is sometimes the fear that oh the disability groups complain about kind of like uh, able-bodied people and the, the lgbtq just sit, sit around kind of like talking about straight people no we've got better things to do there's action to do okay so it's about kind of like supporting kind of like those member groups and what they can feed into the organization but hold your organization accountable see what they're doing uh, helen i can see that you've got a hand up there yeah, it's just um, I'm really enjoying the session. It's just to let you know it's scheduled to finish at two o'clock. It will finish at two o'clock. Don't worry, Fabulous. I've only got one I'm, slide. I was left. just there. Yeah, just checking. Yeah, just check it. No, that's it. Do not worry. It will finish at four o'clock. If you see the little list there on your left, there's only one space left. So there's only room for one more suggestion. OK, so yes. So as I've said, don't please don't forget as well when the media focus kind of like drops. It happens time and time and time again. And it's something that we need to make sure that kind of like we combat. OK, so uh, the Black Lives Matter kind of like thing. I'm talking about the social movement, not the political movement. There is kind of like a difference between the two uh, that that wave of protests that we saw and the wave of support I just thought well I've seen it before here it is and now it's going to disappear uh, uh, and we'll not get any more from it but you know that wave has continued to my surprise it's two years down the line and we're still via the media and via people kind of like talking about issues to do with race equality that's good but with some other groups and with black groups with this one it will die down the media focus drops and when the media focus drops people's interest drops and people's interest in allying drops so we're saying to be an ally just don't stop when the media focus drops still raise those issues kind of like you know if it's an issue kind of here or elsewhere make sure people know about it okay and then the final thing on my list is act. You have to act. You have to do something. I'm not going to talk about voting and harp on about that again. Uh, you can see it there kind of like it's just kind of like encouraging. Remember, you're not voting for you. You're voting for other people. And when people say I can't do as anything as an individual, it's to let you know that you can however big or small. OK, yes, Chantel, I'll make sure that I include the, 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 the PowerPoint slides for this as well. The example there is little Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg was just a school uh, school girl, 13, 14 years old, wasn't happy about the climate, went out with a sign, one girl with a sign and look at where she is now. OK, she's not responsible for us talking about climate change, but she's one of the people responsible for us talking about the climate change agenda. She's certainly one of the reasons that so many young people kind of got involved. OK, so it was one lone voice. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to go ahead and become kind of like a Greta Thunberg. Of course, you're not. But to quote kind of like Alice Walker, we say that activism, OK, is your rent for living on the planet. And so all allyship is a way to be uh, an activist, just helping people out. Uh, however, as I've said in the list, kind of like big or small, um, because uh, instrumental change will not happen. OK, if we do not, I'm going to skip those slides because they work for this one anyway. Instrumental change does not happen without allyship. OK, it's allyship is key in having any lasting change in society because marginalized groups don't have the influence, power or access to decision making. OK, in order to be able to impact that change, all of these changes like uh, women's suffrage wouldn't happen without male allies. Um, a marriage equality wouldn't have happened without straight allies. Uh, apartheid wouldn't have ended. Um, civil rights kind of like in, uh, in America kind of like would not have gained and kind of Jim Crow law laws would not have ended. And slavery kind of like on, on today of all days would not have ended if it wasn't for allies with the advantage, with the privilege, with the power kind of like helping people out. OK, so summing up uh, what we'd say is there you go. Check your bias, check your privilege, educate yourself. Please listen more than you talk. Raise up your voice. Make sure when you're raising up your voice, you're raising up the voices of the marginalized groups, OK? Not just yourself and act. Um, boom, bang on time, bang on time. 
as I've said, I know you say that session finishes at, two, uh, at kind of a two. I don't know if that means that vump uh, kind of like we get cut off. But as I've said, if people have got any questions, they can write to me. They can ask me in the chat box answer now, or you can kind of you can just stick around and ask me if you haven't got anywhere to shoot off to. Lovely. Thank you so much, Justine. That was absolutely, I love that. It was great in terms of, um, I just found it really informative and um, I think you've got a few hands up going there as well. It's just been really good. I don't know, um, obviously I know it was originally scheduled for two o'clock to finish at two, but I don't know if anyone's got any questions and I don't know if anyone wants to put anything in the chat box. Um, Kirsty? Mine's not a question. It was just to say thank you. I really enjoyed that. I could listen to you all afternoon. Um, <laughs> no, it was. It was oh, absolutely don't challenge excellent. me on that, Kirsty, because I could talk to you all afternoon. <laughs> I, I That's just, the problem. Um, I know Helen's going to check out, but I think this, um, just even this recording, would be really good to use within team meetings and um, share with our colleagues, etc. No, I found it really, really interesting. It's given me some food for thought as well about my ally role with the networks um so thank you um for taking right. the time to to share your knowledge with us you are more than welcome thanks very much uh, for your engagement um as well kind of like kirsty and what i'd say is i'll make sure that um as chantal has asked for as well i'll i'll make sure i think i'll send them to terry or if it's more appropriate to send it to somebody else uh, like, because I've got Maria's address as well. I know Maria's on the line. Uh, then it means that um, I, I will, I'll send it, uh, and I'll send it. Hey, Maria, how you doing, babe? Um, I'll send it. Um, I'll send it to Maria or, or, or Terry, uh, and you can have the slides. And also, what I'll do is I'll make sure that we put the reading list. Uh, and well, we'll send you the e-pack. It's got some guides and anything kind That'd of like be that. Great. In. Also, if any of your individual kind of, you know, your other organisations or anything to do with your unison work, you want us to come along, then uh, Terry's the guy to have uh, have a word with and he's got a direct line to us. And so we can get involved via Terry if there's something that you want to do that is via your union and your unison stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to suggest that if I'd like to think that this could lead on to further programs and sessions because I know that we've got the ambassador program that's really been a yep. massive success over, over the last few years and we've had discussions with Maria as well about how we can get the trust to engage I'd be really happy to get that up and running if we could so yeah. if anyone wants any more information on that please just get in touch yeah so say we can we've got the sessions and we can talk if you want us in uh, basically so it's just you know go via the condu uh, conduit of Mr Johnson there and then uh, and, and then it means that we can uh, we can get anything rolling that you need to do yeah, I don't think um, so I'm, I'm calling no yellow hands and no, nothing in the chat, so we've got no yep. questions. But yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you. And um, we will be, I'm, I'm thinking everyone is comfortable obviously sharing this um, presentation in terms of, because we, we were looking to, for all these sessions, we are looking to, um, we're, we've recorded them, we are looking to share them. Um, just so that people have got the, these are kind of if they you know they, they did want to have um watch it and just given that people that ability just to watch yeah. back yeah absolutely no problem i mean the whole idea kind of of these kind of sessions when they're recorded or any work that we do with you it's why we give you the slides yeah. we just want it disseminated as far as possible we're not precious the idea as far as we're concerned is as long as people are going out there and talking about it kind of like you know in a in an informative way oh, i I honestly don't care who does it as long as it's good. I, I don't care who does the work about racism as long as it's good. Uh, and so it's not all about us. So, yeah, please uh, feel free to kind of like uh, circulate it any way that you want. Brilliant. All right. Well, um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for um, attending as well today. And I will uh, draw to, uh, today's session um, to a close. So okay. thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you very much. And thanks for having Bye. me today. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks, Terry. Bye. Bye. See you, Maria. Bye. Justine.